Well, hello and welcome to your viewer. You are now going to be checking out the Vortex Razor HD LHT. LHT stands for Lightweight Hunter Tactical, and that is exactly what this thing is. It's a bridge between a lightweight hunting scope and a tactical scope. Nevertheless, this thing is extremely lightweight as its name suggests. It comes in at a very svelte 21.7 ounces. That is less than half the weight of its big brother, the Razer HD Gen 2 4.5 to 27 by 56, which comes in at around 48 ounces. So there is a big departure from what you'd normally expect from the Razer family with this optic. With all that being said, however, the XLR2 first focal plane reticle found here is not too dissimilar from the EBR7C reticle found in its larger brothers. It's more a little bit scaled down as far as all the peaks and valleys of all the hash marks. The reticle is very clearly on the first focal plane and it is illuminated. However, it's with a push button illumination, not a rotary knob. But that's because this optic sheds a lot of its, how should I say, more tactical nature from its Gen 2 brothers to be as lightweight as possible. It's not a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination, it's just something that you have to realize. Actually getting on topic about talking about this scope, the illumination is so far very good. I'm not expecting much from an HPVO, but from a hunting standpoint, it should be pretty bright. The fact that it's got push button illumination means that when you get to either extreme, either top or bottom, it's going to blink a couple times to let you know that you're at its maximum or its minimum. Here at its maximum brightness, it is very clear and sharp with very little bleed out. It is very nicely done. Now let's go ahead and give those turrets a twist. In the sake of saving weight, the turrets don't feel as metallic or as tactile as they do on the Razer HD Gen 2s. However, they still feel and sound very good. The little bit of play is only because of the lock mechanism that they have on this. The only real criticism I have is that 6 mils per rotation. Again, they scaled it down to make it smaller and lighter, but at least make it 5. Make it a number that at least adds up easy. As you can clearly see, the reticle lines up 100% perfect. Illumination is, once you get it to its brightest setting, right there, because it's blinking at us, is pretty good. Shut it off, press and hold, and we are off to the races. I speed this section up because I don't think anybody wants to hear me count to 80. So, yeah, just enjoy that. Okay. Four and four is absolutely perfect. Resets on the windage absolutely flawlessly. Let's just keep on cranking up on the elevation. There we go. We have a slight bit of a discrepancy. As you can see, 0.1 of a mil at 10 mils of elevation. Let's see if she'll reset. Zero is perfect. Let's give it a go again. So as far as gaining elevation, it's flawless. But we do have that 0.1 of a mil. If I zero it there, let's re-zero it on the elevation. You'll see it clearly tracks back over. But 0.1 of a mil across 10 mils on elevation, you'd be hard pressed to hold your wind for that, that well. Considering the fact this optic is split between lightweight hunter or a tactical optic, this thing tracks extremely well. And as you heard, the turrets sound very good when you're adjusting them. Another weight saving thing that they did, just like Miopto with the Optica 6, with at least in the 3 to 18 by 50 featuring the MRED 1 reticle, they have a capped windish turret. Not only does that save weight, but it makes sense for me because I like to use a reticle like this. 
to hold for wind. I don't necessarily dial in all the time. If I have to, I uncap a turret and that's it. Illumination here, I put it on full, or at least I think I put it on full because it's a push button and you don't know when it's going to turn on or at what brightness setting. It usually defaults to its brightest, but you never really know. And that's the one thing that I really don't like about push button illuminations is that you're kind of left in the dark. You have to press and hold it for a little bit to turn it on and press and hold it to turn it off. I honestly can't imagine a rotary dial really costing that much as far as weight goes. Very slowly taking this thing up to its maximum magnification here at 30 yards. We see that the side focus just makes it to focus this close. This thing has a minimum side focus of 25 meters. So at 30 yards, we're literally right there. Regardless to that very skin of our teeth fact, we have a very good looking image as far as I'm concerned here at 30 yards. The HD glass in this thing really does look like it's high definition. The colors really stand out. There's good contrast. Everything just has this real rich tone to it. Full spoiler alert, this thing really is a Razer HD. The glass on it is sensational. Though it does have a few minor shortcomings again, all in the name of saving weight. And we'll touch on that soon. But just look at how beautiful the wood looks here at 30 yards. However, the eagle-eyed viewers amongst you might notice there's a touch of chromatic aberration against the high contrast areas. And unfortunately, that's not the end of it. You're going to see that come up throughout the rest of this video. One of the side effects of trying to make things super lightweight or fit in a certain package is something's gonna give somewhere. And unfortunately, it's in the form of chromatic aberration. Now, usually I harp on chromatic aberration. There's a reason why I don't like it. I like things to be as perfect one-to-one -one as far as visual colors and contrast and whatnot through it as possible. However, I have heard that some manufacturers purposely put in some chromatic aberration on some hunting optics. So this way it creates a border between two poorly contrasted things. Like example, a deer and a tree in the woods. So it could be on purpose. Anywho, I have the side focus currently set to about 350 meters, which should be just about perfect for that 400 yard brick building. I increased the magnification in increments of 5x till it's maximum of 22, just to give you guys a better idea of what this thing's gonna look like in, in the in-between magnifications. I can't, my friggin' tongue just gets in the way. However, here we are at 22x. And as you'll see, there is a touch of chromatic aberration that pops up on that parapet wall against the bricks and just above it on that little, um, I think it's a, an air vent on top, it ever so slightly creeps in. Beyond that though, we have a very good looking image. I adjust the side focus slightly, but honestly, it lined up really, really closely, which is something that I like to see. I know a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't really matter, but you know what? If it's really close as far as how it should actually look, it's a great way to do real quick, simple ranging, or at least give you a ballpark idea of where you might be. With this being designed with a hunter or a tactical operator in mind, we should have some pretty good contrast in the shadows. And this is a perfect example of a hard shadow. We have very bright surfaces on one side, and in that pocket, we have a pretty dark area. Despite that, we could still make out all of the dark colored bricks and even some of the lighter and medium colored bricks. It's a, it's, this is a very good test to see just how much resolution there is to the glass. And like I said earlier, this thing punches very well for its weight glass. With that pro though comes a slight con, or at least something you have to be aware of. This thing again is slightly neutered from being as good as it possibly can be with certain restraints. And here at four and a half X, the exit pupil does get a little bit tight if you're side to side on it. I increased the magnification again in increments of five and continue that to give you guys a sense of just how delicate the exit pupil can be on this thing. It's not necessarily eye relief front and back. That's actually halfway decent, at least through the bottom half of the magnification range. But the exit pupil, as far as when you're looking through it, it being side to side or up and down, it does get pretty tight. And that's going to be even more relevant very soon when we take a look at 1000 yards. Despite that, though, the image looking through it is still exceptionally good. Here, you could pick up again that slight touch of chromatic aberration right there on the power lines at 30 yards. But again, that power tower off at 800, even with us messing around with the eye box, it really does reward you with patience. Make sure you set up properly and you're going to have something that's absolutely wonderful to use. 
this being a, I guess it's an in-between MPVO and HPVO. It's right around that cusp. I'm going to lean this a little bit more towards the HPVO side of things. And we're going to take a look at here at 1,000 yards. And with zero mils added on this elevation, keep in mind we have a, a 50 yard zero for a 22 LR, roughly plus or minus a half a mil. And we have, again, a good looking Im image. Yeah, yeah. Damn tongue. The one thing you will note is that it's a slight haze, but that's because I don't have the sunshade on this thing, and the sun is basically clear right into the front lens. So if you are going to be shooting towards the sun, or at least have the sun really come down, it is going to make the image a little bit hazy. I take my time adding elevation because this, again, is six mils per rotation. So you got to go six, okay, plus four. One, two, three, four. Anyway. Zooming back in to its maximum at 10 mils added elevation, you'll clearly see that we have a little bit of shadows going on with the image. Again, that's that exit pupil playing tricks on us. I adjust the elevation of the camera to the optic, and you can clearly see it clears up quite well. Not just quite well, but I think the image looks better with added elevation than when it doesn't here at 1,000 yards. Let me show you a little bit closer. It might just be my eye, but which one is which? Can you guess right off the bat? I'll give you a couple of seconds. A couple more seconds. A couple of more seconds. All right. The left side is zero mils added. The right side is plus 10. And the image just looks ever so slightly cleaner, ever so slightly sharper. The lines are just a little bit more defined. Contrast wise, there's even more contrast. Look at the trees under at the bottom part of the image. The shadows are deeper and richer. Phenomenal. This is actually the first time that I've noticed with added elevation, the image looks superior. However, that was during a very bright, sunny day. Let's fast forward a couple of hours, tail end of August when I film this. The sun has very clearly set over the horizon. It's around 8 p.m. Hunting optics are usually set up with a very large front objective to help allow a lot more light in because guess what? A lot of animals come out during the twilight, kind of like what we have right now, and you might be in a hard to read area like again, a lot of brown tree trunks and brown deer. This however only has a 50 millimeter front objective and a 30 millimeter tube, so will it let in a lot of light? With the illumination very clearly on, Finally, we take it to its maximum magnification here and look at that parapet wall. It only gets a little bit darker at the very top end of its magnification range. That means you have a very usable magnification range where this thing's going to let in at least as much light as you could see. When we get to the bottom of our illumination brightness, as you just saw, it will blink to let you know you are at the bottom. Going back up to its maximum, once you get it there, you go to try to make it a little bit brighter, it will blink at you again to signify, hey, this is as bright as it'll go. This is a very good performance as far as letting in light. I've seen worse performances from much larger optics, and it just goes to show you how good the glass is on this thing. We're not going to spend that much time here at 50 yards, primarily because we already know this thing looks very good at closer distances. And we know the side focus goes down to 25 meters, so 50 yards is well within this thing's wheelhouse. However, just for shits and giggles, Let's slowly take it up the magnification range in increments of five like I've been doing for the rest of this video to give you guys a sense of just how clearly you can pick up a target at 50 yards. At this point in time, fall was in the air, the leaves have changed and are already started to drop, and it's goodbye summer again. Fortunately for myself, I love the fall. It's probably my favorite season, except for when it's not really fall. In the Northeast, we sometimes don't have fall. It's usually 90 degrees, 30 degrees, and then back up to 90 degrees. I like the in-between seasons, and unfortunately, we don't get that all the time. Enough of me talk about that BS. Image here is fantastic. Those 22 LR holes are very easily picked up. You can practically use this thing for F-Class if you want, and you know what? I absolutely would. The reticle is excellent for that. That little perfectly small fine center dot and the opening right around it really allows you to get very precise with this thing. With my camera full set to manual mode, the sun comes out to let you know, hey, when this thing is slightly over bright, you'll see that there is a purple tint to the paper. And that's that chromatic aberration really starting to come back into its own. It's only really noticeable when it's super bright and towards the top end of its magnification range. Backing it back down off its max, you don't really notice it. The ever important eye box test. 
like I said earlier, the exit pupil can be a little tight, but the eye box itself going forward and back is quite open and forgiving. And you can see, you can get the scope body of this thing to practically disappear just right. However, side to side, it does start to dance on you. And because this is first focal plane, if we could see the illumination from it being, if it was bright enough, you wouldn't be able to see it when you're off in the shadows. Bring it up to 10X here and you'll see it's the natural progression of things. It's going to get progressively worse and worse and tighter and tighter. Side to side here is exceptionally tight, but forward and back again isn't terrible. It's only when you get to about 15x here where things start to get very tight. And again, it's a limitation of the scope itself. 30 millimeter tube, 50 millimeter front objective, and we have a four and a half to 22. Trying to be as lightweight as possible, it's gotta give somewhere. And even if I had this on a precision rig, which I don't think I'd be too opposed to having this on there. You're probably going to set up with a good solid cheek weld each and every time. Here at its maximum, what else could you expect? It's going to be this way on every optic. Even the top, top, top dogs will still have a more tight eye box because that's just the way mechanics work, ladies and gentlemen. Regardless, though, this could be a lot worse. So let's finally put this side by side with some of what I would consider to be its rivals. On the right is the Miopta Optica 6 3 to 18 by 50. This comes in around 700 ish dollars where you could find it, and this one features the M Red 1 reticle. I love that scope so much, it's found a permanent home, well, semi permanent home, on my go to rifle for my quote unquote precision setup. Regardless, though, these two optics are very similar. As far as their overall construction, they both feature locking turrets on the elevation, capped windage, side focus illumination more or less the same sort of magnification range and price point yeah there's going to be a slight discrepancy basically the razor is twice the price but is it twice the optic it's hard to say i think the glass definitely goes to the razor hd here it performs exceptionally well though the miopta is no slouch but keep in mind the miopta is still nine ounces heavier than this razor so that's what you're going for also if you want less scope body lht all day long Next is not a necessarily fair comparison. It's actually the Minox ZP55-25. This optic is about three times the price of the LHT, but yet I have them side by side because I really do think the glass on this LHT is comparable to something significantly more expensive. I also think that the LHT tracked a little bit truer to my target than the ZP5, and honestly, is there much of a difference when you're really looking through it? Yeah, the ZP-5 has got a 34mm tube, 56mm front objective, but just look at these two side by side. There are definitely key differences between them, and yes, I know one's in snow, one's in green grass fields, so the colors are going to be slightly different, but regardless, they both look really damn impressive. And the ZP-5 is set up specifically to be a maximum performance tactical option. Whereas, again, this LHT is a combination of everything under the sun, with the exception of it being an LPVO. If they had this be a 2 to 22, it would be fucking wild, but we're not at that technology yet. So, again, image quality-wise, there is a difference, but it's not a gigantic one. As good as the ZP-5 looks, though... Nothing has compared to the ZCO, the Zero Compromise Optics 4 to 20 sent in by Scott. This thing is just on a next level as far as the colors go. These were filmed on very similar days, and just look at the difference to the image. As good as the LHT is, it's not going to come close to the contrast levels, the brightness levels, and the colors of the ZCO. And it honestly shouldn't for the price difference. You're talking about at least three times the price difference. Like I said with the ZCO in that review, it is a full-on experience and a damn well should be for the price. But for the money, I'd be absolutely happy with how well the LHT looks. And that's going to be the perfect segue to get into my final thoughts on this thing. One last little segment that I haven't really talked about is just the overall field of view. And I'm just going to talk about this because you can very clearly see it. This thing at 4.5x right here at 100 yards, you see 23.5 feet, which is tiny, minuscule even, to its big brother, the Razer HD Gen 2 at 4.5x, which is 25.3 feet. That is a sizable difference. But again, 
The Razer HD Gen 2 4 and a half to 27 by 56 is more than twice the weight. And that's where I'm going to really drive this thing home. This is, by design, by its nature, by its very premise, a flawed optic. The designers and developers created this with the intent of it being as lightweight as possible. So, as a result, they had to cut a few corners. They had to sacrifice a few things. Push-button illumination, I don't particularly care for it all that much, but guess what? It's going to be lighter than a rotary dial. If it wasn't, guess what? It would have a rotary dial. Capped windage, I actually really don't mind it. In fact, I prefer it because of the reticle that we have here. But guess what? It's lighter to have a capped turret than it is to have an exposed locking turret. Six mils per rotation on the elevation turret that feels slightly plasticky. Guess what? It's a lot lighter than having the 10 mils per rotation on the locking turrets from a Razer HD Gen 2. This thing also doesn't have a fast focus eyepiece because regular eyepieces are a lot lighter than fast focus eyepieces and much simpler to develop, which I don't know why they don't offer it on every magnified optic on the fucking planet, but that's just me. The smaller tube and the smaller front objective, 30 millimeter and 50 millimeter respectively, again, is going to be a lighter option than, well, a 34 millimeter tube and a 56 millimeter front objective. But at least it's not a one inch tube. But I think they did that intentionally, not for weight savings, but so you have more adjustment on your elevation and your windage if you need it. Because again, despite the fact that it's designed to be as lightweight as possible, it's still a double duty optic where it's going to be a quote unquote tactical option as well. And in that quote unquote tactical role, how does it perform? Because we already know due to its weight savings and its very good light transmission, especially in that mid range magnification, this thing can and will be a good hunting optic. I'm not saying this is the best hunting optic. No, 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 specific hunting optic is gonna be still a better option. But keep in mind, this is supposed to be a bridge between two gaps lightweight hunting and tactical. Because what happens if you only have one gun that you use for both? What happens if you don't want to have QD mounts or QD rings and swap out between optics? You're going to go with something like this. As far as picking up 223 caliber holes in the black at 100 yards, I put a three shot group onto that paper and you can very easily see where they land. I'm not even going to tell you, you should be able to see it for yourself. That is with M855 ball through my Ruger American. Again, though, topped with my Miopta 3 to 18 by 50. It's a good combination. But enough about the Miopta Optica 6. We're still talking about this LHT. And I gotta be honest with you, folks. I absolutely adore this thing. It hits all of its notes extremely well, even if it does, like you saw right there, create a little bit of darkness on the left hemisphere because the exit pupil does get tight towards the top part of the magnification range. But again, a very solid cheek weld and good muscle memory, and you shouldn't really have that much of an issue. Overall, how could you not at least appreciate what Vortex has done with this optic? This might not be your cup of tea. You might want balls to the wall extreme on either end. But as far as filling in a gap in the middle for how well this thing performs, how good the glass looks, how good this thing tracks, honestly, how bright the illumination is. For an HPVO, it's honestly pretty damn good. I take a couple of pop shots at that golf ball at 180-ish yards, so you can enjoy that. But this thing is just a very solid performing optic. It feels extremely well made. It is made in Japan. It comes with Vortex's incredible lifetime warranty that you could throw this thing off a building and they'd be like, okay, here's a replacement or we fully refurbished it. Yes, Cuppies, I hear you. Oh, you're so cute. Oh, so cute. Sorry, cat time, more important sometimes. This might not be your cup of tea. You might want to go to one extreme or the next, in which case that's entirely up to you. But if you're on the fence about getting something that could try to do both, if it's going to be any good, well, this might just be your ticket. Illumination on full is just enough to see that it's slightly red, but we'll take a closer look at that soon. Only you can, of course, answer the question, is this right for you or not? I don't know what your preference is. I don't know what's, what your setup is, what you're looking for, your environments, X, Y, Z, one, two, three. That's up to you. Hopefully I've laid out enough information that you can make a very well-educated decision for yourself to be able to make a good, solid investment. If you do a lot of shooting at 200, you can spot your own holes with a 223 at 200. 
at 300 yards as you see here that page to the far top left i think had six five creedmoor holes in it i'm pretty sure that's what that guy shoots for f class out at a thousand yards he was just doing a little bit of load development this day and yes you can just make them out this isn't going to take the place of a high-end spotting scope but if you needed to in a pinch you could just make them out as I spot for my friend Noah trying to get some dope on his 223 out at 320 ish yards, I will conclude this video while you enjoy that. This is an excellent optic as a bridge between two worlds. It sacrifices a couple of things at the cost of, honestly, incredible lightweightness. Picking this thing up in hand literally feels like it's a toy, especially by comparison to its larger brothers, the Razer HD Gen 2s. Yet, this still doesn't feel like it's going to fall apart in your hands. Yes, you can buy options from Loophold and the like, and maybe even spend more money, but not necessarily get that much more of an optic. This thing strikes a very healthy balance, and it's an optic that I've grown to love the more I use it. The only thing that it needs for me is a cattail for the magnification ring. Other than that, it's done everything I've asked of it, and that's all I could really hope for. The only thing I wish Vortex would do, if you're listening, make the 3 to 15 with the exact same reticle of the first focal plane. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of this video of me making hits on that steel plate at 320 yards with my Ruger. And thank you all very much for watching. As always, see you again next time. It's gone, dude. And a huge thank you to my Patreon providers and my Subscribestar subscribers. Without you, this truly wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those, I completely understand. But you could still help by using my affiliate links in the description below, and or like, share, and subscribe as always. Again, thank you very much.